Hello, welcome back to New Scientist Weekly. This is your curated selection of the week's science stories. I'm Rowan Hooper. Now, it's episode 182. We're recording this on April the 19th. Welcome to the show. Coming up this week, we are looking at using 3D printing to print electric circuits inside living organisms. We're also checking in on what's happening in the great garbage patch in the Pacific Ocean. And staying with oceans, we're going to hear about what would happen if you try to engineer them for carbon storage and what that might mean for marine ecosystems. We've also got a fascinating interview about chat GPT and human intelligence with Melanie Mitchell, who's Professor of Complexity at the Santa Fe Institute in New Mexico. But we're going to start with a story on insects, which is always where we should begin, I believe. Uh, Michael LePage joins us for this. Michael, this week, you've got a story on why insects are attracted to lights or or actually how they may not be attracted to lights. Well, what's going on? Yeah, I really love this story because it's a completely new explanation for this really common phenomenon. So we've all seen insects flying around lights and wondered why on earth are they doing this? Yeah. We know we know the Romans noticed this behaviour. And I, I, I think people must have known about this for as, as long as we've had fires and lights. So uh, it's yeah. a really common thing. But don't we know why? I mean, I thought it was something about polarised lights being different from artificial lights and that messes up their navigation or something. So, so polarized light is definitely an issue for insects that use that to find water. But the you know non polarized lights are a problem for a much broader range of insects. There are various explanations. So, scientifically, the leading idea has been that insects are using the moon's light to navigate at night, and then they mistake in artificial lights for the moon. Right. But the celestial navigation idea doesn't really explain much because there's there are insects that only fly during daytime, like dragonflies, that still gather around night. And also, if you look at the details of this, it should mean that insects sort of spiral in towards lights, but they don't actually do that. So you can find lots of explanations from various sources, but none of them actually really explain what's going on. OK, wow. So what what's the new explanation? So this comes from Sam Fabian at uh, Imperial College London and his colleagues. And what they did is use high speed videos to film insects around lights. They saw these three really notable behaviours. So the first is when insects just fly around lights, which we call orbiting. That's the one we're all familiar with. Yeah. But they also do the thing where when they pass under a light, they start doing this loop the loop over the light. And then when their climbing, the sort of climbing angle gets too steep, they sort of <laughs> stall and start sort of falling and sometimes fall on the light. And that's sort of the really the strangest one is what they saw is when they come over the top of a light, they often flip over and start flying upside down. And then, of course, often sort of plummet to the ground. So these, what does these... all that mean, Michael? <laughs> well, what the researchers realise is that in all of these cases, what they're actually doing is that they're trying to fly in a way that keeps their backs facing towards the light. <laughs> so what, why would they do this? Well, it turns out there's something called the dorsal light response, which is actually mm. this kind of shortcut that's used by some fish and, and quite a lot of insects kind of work out which way is up in a real hurry. And right. basically, Yeah, and basically they're just going, the brightest part of the sky is up. And that's how they sort of working out which way is up. I mean, wouldn't you then just always sort of fly away from the sun or the moon? Well, you you would have your back. You mean do you, would you sort of always point your back at the sort of the sun or the moon? Yeah. So, uh, well, the thing about this this response is not about sort of point sources of light. It's about the sort of the largest bright area. So they're looking at sort of almost the whole hemisphere. Which which hemisphere is the brightest? And so if you think about that, the sun and the moon are always going to be a tiny part of an insect's visual field normally. But as, a, as an insect flies towards an electric light, that's going to occupy a bigger and bigger part of its visual field. And eventually it's going to trigger this dorsal light response. And they're going to sort of try and point their backs to it. And that can end in disaster if they're flying above it, for instance. <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's not uh, this, this dorsal light response obviously isn't perfect. It won't work in in all circumstances and not all insects use it and or will use it to various degrees. So the researchers found that some insects, they sort of found that fruit flies and hawk moths sort of didn't have this response, for instance. But basically, this is saying that the, the uh, sort of folklore idea that lights attract insects, that's wrong. Yeah, uh, that, that's a really surprising thing. Lights may be a sort of trap. So Fabian and his colleagues are mm. suggesting that it's only when insects actually 
pass by accident close enough to a light to trigger this response that they get trapped into this sort of flying in circles or trying to fly into circles response. And so the lights are more like a, a sort of a conventional trap than something that's actually luring them from afar. It's just it's just the ones that are passing by that get mm. get stuck. When we talk about insects, we have to mention the the apocalypse. You know, the the decrease in insect numbers and insect populations. Is this going to help us in, in in any way? I mean, we don't know to what extent lights are contributing towards that, but that's definitely the aim of the research. The whole point of the research is to try and sort of work out what's going on when, right. when insects are around lights and to sort of design lights that can sort of avoid the, the, the bad responses. Now, we're going to go to an unorthodox life form of the week this week. It's about the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, which, as a reminder, it's this massive swathe of plastic junk and rubbish in the Pacific between Hawaii and California. But I didn't realise quite how big it was. Madeline Cuff is here to tell us all about it. Maddie. Yeah, it's a pretty eye-popping patch of ocean. We're talking 1.6 million square kilometres of ocean that this plastic waste covers. That's a, yeah, it's crazy, isn't it? And is it, you know, you can't walk on it, right? It's not all solidified together, is it? Or is it? (laughs) No, um, so that's a pretty common misconception. They're not kind of islands of plastic rubbish. It's actually kind of a whole load of marine debris that's constantly mixing both above and below the surface so definitely not you definitely can't walk on them but you also definitely wouldn't want to swim through it that the reason why it's in the news is that scientists have found that there are some creatures that want to set up home there and what's surprising is that these creatures are traditionally coastal marine creatures and now they've been found setting up home thousands of kilometers away from their natural habitat so it's not like it's a good thing then that we've got these new habitats forming. It, you know, it could be a stepping stone for species to get to the wrong places, really, right? Yeah, that's right. So this isn't probably something that we should celebrate. It's, a, it's an <laughs> indication that coastal species can survive kind of far outside their comfort zone. But that also means that they could jump to new places and do lots of damage as invasive species. So it's yeah. sort of a worrying development, really. Yeah. And what are they finding there, living there? Basically, some some researchers gathered some bits of plastic waste from this garbage patch and they found that more than 70% of the plastic items that they collected had evidence of some coastal species living on them. So when we talk about coastal species, these are kind of really tiny organisms like shrimp-like arthropods or sea anemones and mollusks. But what was really surprising was the fact that the coastal species found on the plastic outnumbered ocean-dwelling species that live in the open sea by a ratio of three to one, which is pretty surprising. And the other really kind of cool, interesting finding was that these coastal creatures seem to have kind of set up a permanent home on the garbage patch. They're living and reproducing there. So the researchers think that they rafted out with coastal debris and basically have kind of set up a novel community out on the plastic. Well, that's that's kind of what I was wondering about it coalescing together, if it kind of gets bound together by, you know, seaweed, basically, uh, algae and stuff. Um, but how stable is it, is it as an ecosystem then, you know, with all the different levels you might expect to find of of herbivores and predators and stuff? Yeah, so that's a bit of an unanswered question at the moment. They've kind of only just discovered that these coastal species are kind of living and thriving on this plastic debris, but we don't really know much about how they fit into the ecosystem around the garbage patch, you know, what feeds on them, what they feed on, how they're interacting with kind of passing fish or other ocean species. So there's lots of research still to do, but what the findings kind of, do solidify is this emerging evidence that we've got new types of ecological communities, the researchers call them neopelagic communities, that are establishing themselves on plastic debris in the ocean. And the Great Pacific Garbage Patch is not the only garbage patch in the world's oceans. There are several like it. So it's quite probable that there are coastal creatures setting up home on all of these garbage patches around the world. And as we kind of mentioned, yeah, this is 
not necessarily a good thing. It could be worrying because it could enable the spread of new species around the world. It's already a pretty big problem with global shipping that species can kind of hitch a ride on the hull of ships and arrive in new places that aren't set up to deal with them. And essentially, these floating communities could kind of act in the same way as hubs for invasive species to to reach new territories. All right. I'm no longer looking for any <laughs> silver lining to the idea of these uh, vast garbage dumps in the ocean. It's, re- it's a really melancholy thing. What about clearing it up? Is there anything, that, you know, what can we do about this? Yeah, that's kind of the million dollar question. There are organisations out there that are trying to clear up the garbage patch, but it's a huge task. I mean, the US National Ocean and Atmospheric Administration has estimated that it would take 67 ships a whole year to clean up less than 1% of the affected area of the Pacific Ocean. And it's a bit of a Sisyphusian task if you're still adding plastic to the ocean so lots of marine experts would say we've really kind of got to deal with the problem at source first and stop putting unnecessary plastic waste into the ocean and then once we've dealt with that then we can kind of figure out how to clean up what's already floating out there and now a note from our sponsor wellness company lima the ancient egyptians used sunlight to disinfect and heal wounds making light therapy one of the oldest therapeutic methods used by humans now evidence is growing that by delivering specific wavelengths of red laser light to precise areas of the body it may be possible to fine-tune biochemical processes to aid cell rejuvenation and healing various studies have shown significant benefits in wound healing in stimulating collagen growth and in treating the appearance of wrinkles lima has developed a pioneering low-level laser therapy device for use at home. You can find out more about the science behind this therapy in the link in the show notes. And we're back and it's time for the sci-fi section with Alex Wilkins this week. Uh, Alex, scientists have for the first time printed electronics inside a living organism. What is going on? It it sounds like complete science fiction. We're not quite at the stage of being cyborgs yet and and integrating ourselves with ChatGPT and the machines. So researchers have been experimenting for a while with 3D printing objects inside living organisms. It's not actually as difficult as it might sound. Basically, if you have your ink, which can be any sort of plastic or polymer, and something to shape it with, like a laser, then you've got the rudimentary sort of workings of a 3D printer. What's more difficult and what this group at the University of Lancaster did was for the first time they printed conductive material inside a living organism. In this case, it was a nematode worm. It's really just the beginnings, but one day they hope it could lead to fully working circuits and even implants. Wow. So they are explicitly on the path to wanting to make cyborgs. Um, So how, how did they do it? Take us through it. Yeah, so it it was a relatively straightforward process. The the first step was they mixed in ink, a form of sort of plastic polymer, in with the worm's food. This plastic monomer is called polypyrrole. They then fed the worms their inky food. And then the researchers used a specific kind of 3D printer, which uses a high-powered laser. And once this laser hits the inky sections, then the monomer turns into a polymer, forms these sort of long chains, and that makes it conductive for electricity. It also just so happens that this polymer is fluorescent. So once they'd formed the ink into shapes that they specifically tried to, like a star shape, they could then image this conductive ink uh, with a fluorescence microscope. So it glowed in the dark, basically, to confirm they'd made these shapes. So it doesn't fry the worm with shining this high-powered laser on it? No, the, the um, they were very keen to impress on, upon me that this was a sort of safe level and it's it's very focused in a sort of small area of the worm if you're interested in making a cyborg creature wouldn't you just implant your electronics into a a living organism why why do you want to print something inside it yeah so it's a really good question and already even now pre-cyborg age we've got loads of implants like pacemakers bionic ears and and thousands of implants in people every single day But with implants, there's always this risk of infection. No matter how small the implant is, uh, no matter how insignificant, it could always get infected and lead to complications. And there's also the problem of what do you do when it malfunctions? Taking it out and putting it back in again every time you need to repair it invites even more risk of infection and sort of traumatic Mm. surgery. 
Wow, um, pre-cyborg age. But so we are still in the pre-cyborg age. But how long until we're we're actually in the cyborg age? There's a long way to go from what they demonstrated here. They 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 showed that the material was conductive and they they made it into shape they wanted, but they still don't have that sort of fine control to make um, circuits yet. And the worm nematode worm is obviously a very long way from the complicated organisms that we are. Um, mm. So I imagine they'll have to try it in lots of sort of smaller model organisms like rabbits and pigs. And for each of those animals, they'll need approval uh, and they'll need to sort of improve their technique and, and show that it's safe. So we're probably quite a few years away from seeing yeah. um, 3D printed cyborgs yet. But I guess it, you know, down the line, you could start doing some really interesting things if you can get implants into people for example for deep brain stimulation it, you know if you could print something inside without having to open them up and you could start treating epilepsy and alzheimer's perhaps things like that yeah no absolutely and specifically with these um, diseases of the brain which act on often very specific areas like alzheimer's for instance is thought to affect certain regions in the frontal lobe and often deep brain stimulation is a promising treatment where electrodes are placed into the brain and, and stimulate these areas but as we were talking about before it's there's a real risk of infection when you're using these electrodes in the brain so being able to target these brain areas sort of hands-free and, and just formulating the implants with a laser would be a real improvement thanks alex let's go back to maddie now as maddie you've got a story about using the ocean to boost carbon storage. Um, what's the idea here? Yes, yeah, so this is a bit complex, so, so bear with me, but it's all about making seawater more alkaline to speed up carbon storage, essentially. So it's called ocean alkalinity enhancement. And so this is a form of carbon dioxide removal that essentially is about drawing down excess pollution from the atmosphere. And so in this ocean alkalinity enhancement, the idea is that you add alkaline substances like calcium oxide or basalt to ocean water, basically to make it more alkaline. And that helps to convert dissolved CO2 in seawater into bicarbonates and carbonates, which in turn unlocks more capacity for the oceans to draw down more CO2 from the atmosphere. And we hear a lot about the problems of ocean acidification don't we i mean corals and loads of, of organisms are suffering from it so i guess that that's a, a good thing to counter that yes yeah, so there so there is a school of thought that suggests that ocean alkalinization could kind of have twin benefits so you boost carbon storage in the oceans and you help to reverse some ocean acidification mm. but I mean, it's a pretty big, but we don't really know how the oceans will react to geoengineering on this scale. Um, and this week I've been covering some new research, which suggests that there's some pretty good reason for us to be cautious. Hmm. Essentially, there's a new study out where some researchers in the US used computer modelling to simulate what would happen if you release vast quantities of alkaline minerals into the ocean. And they are essentially warning that it could have pretty catastrophic consequences for the marine food web so right. that's not terribly reassuring <laughs> um uh, yeah i mean when you put it like that releasing vast quantities of alkaline into the ocean i guess doesn't sound good but do we know why what, what you know the mechanism it's going to screw up yeah, so the, so the key thing here is its impact on what's called the marine biological pump, which is the, the mechanism basically by which organic carbon in the ocean sinks and dissolves. And right. so a key kind of component of this biological pump is marine snow. And that's essentially like the, the kind of particle field of organic and inorganic materials that drift down to the deep ocean. So if you've ever seen kind of underwater cameras in the deep sea you'll see this kind of gently falling snow and that's this marine snow that we're talking about yeah. and it's it's really central to the ecological and biological function of the of the ocean it essentially is the mechanism by which the ocean is kind of drawing down and storing carbon for us and basically the theory is that if we're taking a load of minerals and, and, and adding them to the ocean then they're going to somehow kind of interact with this background particle field in in unpredictable ways so what happened when the researchers ran their computer models was that they found that if you add lots of naturally occurring alkaline minerals like basalt and olivine into the ocean, they were pretty ineffective at boosting 
ocean carbon absorption and that's because they don't dissolve very well in seawater and because they don't dissolve very well it means there's lots of these particles kind of floating around adding to this background particle field and that means that ocean organisms like zooplankton at the very base of the marine food web have to kind of search higher and lower for food so it kind of disrupts the the energy balance of the base of the marine ocean web. Your mention of olivine reminded me that there's lots of people talking about spreading olivine on beaches to draw down carbon dioxide. I wonder if that's a better idea because it wouldn't perhaps mess up the marine food webs as much. Yeah, so you're right. It's a kind of slightly different proposition because it's not that these materials like basalt and olivine are are particularly toxic in themselves. It's more that they're kind of disrupting the composition of this marine snow and therefore kind of changing the hunting habits of these zooplankton and and other creatures at at the base of the food web. One thing to point out is that this study was modelling the impacts of releasing these materials into the deep ocean. So we don't really know whether these impacts will apply to using similar techniques on beaches or or coastal waters, for example. So we do need much more research to kind of answer that question. And the other thing to point out is that naturally occurring minerals are not the only thing you can add to the ocean to increase its alkalinity. You can also add um, manufactured alkaline materials like calcium oxide or magnesium oxide. And they're probably actually the ones that are most likely to be used for carbon sequestration. And the good news is that these ones dissolve more quickly in ocean waters and therefore probably pose less of a risk to this kind of particle field of marine snow. So it might be that these are a safer way of doing this carbon sequestration in the ocean. I do like that we can talk about particle fields, even though we're not physicists. That's, uh, that's, that <laughs> I know, it's really a cool. new one for me. <laughs> <laughs> um, and there's a there's a Canadian firm that's actually preparing an experiment or a, a trial, isn't there, um, this summer? Yeah, so that's what's kind of really fascinating about this study is that it comes at a really topical time for this issue. There's lots of companies around the world that are kicking off trials for ocean-based carbon removal and there's lots of kind of Silicon Valley investor interest in, in the potential for these technologies. And one really imminent trial is here in the UK, there's a Canadian firm called Planetary Technologies that essentially later this summer wants to release about 300 tonnes of magnesium hydroxide into waters off the coast of Cornwall later this mm. year. And they've obviously they're doing this with full permission. That's a lot of stuff to dump in the water, isn't it? They're, they're working on getting permission to, oh. to do the trial at the moment. Um, right. So it's a bit okay. of a live issue. Um, right. but, but when I spoke to them and, and kind of put the findings of this study to them, they, they kind of stressed that what they want to do is a really small pilot, 300 tonnes in the grand scheme of things is is not that much. And that it's happening in a really different scenario to this study. It's in shallow coastal waters. But they, they did kind of stress that this is a trial and they're going to be monitoring the impacts very closely. And of course, if they see any kind of adverse impacts on the marine biological pump or in marine snow, that they said they'll kind of halt the trial immediately. But I mean, I think it's a a healthy reminder of the fact that there's still so much we don't really know about how these efforts to kind of boost carbon storage in the ocean will intersect with the ecological functions of the ocean and that we should really probably be proceeding with quite a lot of caution. Okay, so we've been reporting about artificial intelligence a lot over the years, but it's gone to another level, hasn't it, with chat GPT and GPT-4. So those, as you will be aware, are artificial neural networks trained on massive amounts of data of human generated content like they've read wikipedia all of reddit you know most of the internet's been scraped and they that's how they learn what they do and that, that's why they're called large language models and they're really breaking into our lives more and more in the magazine this week we've got a special issue looking at large language models and what it all means and as part of it our features editor Dan Cosins spoke with Melanie Mitchell she's professor of complexity at the Santa Fe Institute in New Mexico and she's the author of the book Artificial Intelligence a guide for thinking humans and Dan asked her first about the rise of open AI. We are seeing an era of astounding progress in linguistic abilities in AI and some other abilities as well. 
over the last maybe five years, we've seen these large language models emerge, which are trained on enormous amounts of human-generated language. And, you know, they've been able to, for a long time, generate rather fluent human-sounding-like text. But only in the last couple of years have we seen these systems that have these what people are calling emergent behaviors that kind of go beyond language, that are able to do things that seem like they're reasoning, that they're able to solve problems on their own that go beyond language, and that they're able to sort of understand in some sense the world just by having been trained on enormous amounts of human-generated text. So it's a very surprising moment. I think everybody in the field has been surprised by what these systems can do. But I think there's also, you know, we have to think about what these systems cannot do, what their limitations are, and how they differ from, like, what we would call human understanding of language. And here's a bit where Dan asked Melanie about whether we're on course to see the emergence of a new kind of intelligence. I've heard a lot of people in psychology questioning whether humans have general intelligence. (laughs) You know, human intelligence is very specific to our particular evolutionary niche, right? And it might not be as general as we think it is. That being said, I do think that scaling these models is probably not going to end up with the kind of, you know, human-like understanding that we, we want in these models. And, you know, we don't want just linguistic understanding, we want visual understanding and the ability to take actions, you know, to do the right thing in a given situation. Mm-hmm. And I think that we will need some different kinds of architectures. I mean, for one example is, you know, language models like GPT-4, they have no long-term memory. I mean, they have like the weights that have been kind of frozen into them through their training, but mm-hmm. they don't form new memories. So they don't have any sense of like a personal biography. <laughs> mm-hmm. They don't have experiences. They don't remember the conversations that they've had. And it, and also they don't, in some sense, they don't care. You know, this has been pointed out by a lot of people that a lot of our intelligence is centered in the fact that, that we have these motivations mm. and intelligence is, is like a way to achieve the goals that, you know, evolution has set for us. And if a system doesn't have any motivations or any of its own goals, mm. you know, maybe it can't achieve the kind of intelligence that we have. That was Melanie Mitchell talking about GPT-4, and we'll post a link to that interview in the show notes, and it's really worth looking at, as is the whole of the special issue. That's it for this week. Thanks to our guests, Madeline Cuff, Michael LePage, and Alex Wilkins, and thanks to you for listening. Do subscribe to our show, tell all your friends about it, and we'll see you soon. Bye for now. Bye. Bye. This podcast is produced by OG Podcasts. Find out more at ogpodcasts.co.uk.